All right, well, hello there. I have finished Madame Proust and the Coacher Kitchen by Kate Taylor. Uh, overall, I really enjoyed this book. Um, it has a definite Canadian uh, can lit flavor to it. It, um, by that I mean, there's the intergenerational story. Uh, there is a coldness to it, uh, kind of uh, intellectual sensibility to it, like where even the emotional stuff feels a little not emotional. Um, and that just tends to be the way that Canlit goes generally, I find. Um, I didn't mind it so much in this book. I find if I read too much Canadian literature in succession, I find it's, I start to get kind of annoyed um, just because I feel like it is it is such a common flavor, I guess, would be a good way of putting it. Um, but it's been a long time since I've read a book by a Canadian author, I realized as I was reading it, and I actually kind of enjoyed it. It felt like coming home a little bit. Um, yeah, so I didn't mind that so much. The, the writing itself, uh, so essentially, I should say, um, it's a story, well, it's three stories that begin, they seem at first to be kind of interwoven, but then you realize, no, they're actually parallel stories. I think actually at first I thought, oh, they're juxtapositions. And then I realized, no, they're not interwoven and they're not juxtapositions. They're actually uh, parallel stories. Um, and they are, they're actually very, very closely parallel stories told, a, you know, a century apart. Um, the first is the story of Madame Proust and her relationship with her son, essentially. And then the second one is the story of the narrator and a friend of hers and her friend's mother. So that gets a little complicated, I guess. Um, but the relationship is between her and her friend. Uh, but the story of her friend's mother gets told as well because the relationship between her friend and her friend's mother is so paralleled to the relationship of Proust and his mother, I guess. Um, overall, I enjoyed the book. The writing was really... Uh, nicely done. I enjoyed it. There were sections in here that were really, um, I really, really enjoyed. There's a section where she's describing autumn. And personally, I have different seasons affect me differently every year. I never know what it's going to be like for me from year to year, but I've had years where fall felt exactly like this. Even at the best of times, Sarah hated September. It was a month of lost hope, of sorrowful realism, of back to school, knee socks and notebooks. It was the time when summer, when the summer light after the long hazy afternoon of, of August achieved such a clarity and intensity, you knew this had to be its last days. It seemed that things could happen in the summertime and that life might change, that lightness might prevail. Then September arrived, bringing with it an aching disappointment and mute sense of loss. It had been a month in 1942 when Sarah had been forced to recognize that her visit to Toronto was not some exotic summer holiday. She was not going home this year. Starting school that autumn, not long before the October of her 12th birthday, it seemed so wrong to her, at best an unpleasant compromise demanded by the circumstances, and at worst a betrayal of her parents. For 11 years now, it had proved impossible for her to fully enter into this other life as though it might be a natural one. 
Each September marked another year between her and her past, yet no change of feeling, no progress in her life. The gap quietly appalled her. To cross it was to abandon her parents. To stay on this side was to forego the adult cares and pleasures that must of necessity fill the future if she was to have any future at all. Uh, anyway, yeah, so I felt like that really, I really related to that description of autumn. And then there's just another really, there's lots of really lovely passages like that. Um, one of the themes in the book, uh, one of the big themes is about language and meaning, uh, and how those two things, uh, can trick us and are tricky. Um, the main character in this book is a translator. That's her job. Realize it. We say sometimes realize this project cannot be realized without a firm commitment, etc. But even as I write the word, I know fulfill or achieve would be better. The meaning more quickly seized by the Anglophone ear. The Francophone will occasionally borrow the English meaning and offer realize for understand, recognize or grasp. But the usage is sloppy and would have been unknown to Madame Proust. The project will be achieved, or we will complete the project. I pick at these words, plucking them out for you, rejecting the bruised ones, amassing them together like berries in a basket. What will I make of this rich bounty? What project is fulfilled here? Language is a veil that separates me from experience. I process both my English and my French self-consciously, Flourishing my mastery of an extravagant colloquialism in the one or a labyrinthine construction in the other, like a child parading about in her mother's high heels. I always speak with a firm fluency, yet words are an achievement rather than a home. English has at least double the vocabulary of French, always offering the speaker the choice between the Anglo-Saxon and the Latinate. Will you begin or shall I commence? To speak English is to pick words carefully, cleverly, methodically, slowly, for meaning is found in its vocabulary, imparted through the choice of cheap over inexpensive, push over shove, love over like. In French, the choices are limited, the field more restricted, but the play swifter and more subtle. Meaning lies in syntax, in what order one places the lovely Latinate syllables. The decisions must be made with both light, lightning swiftness and sharp foresight. Once embarked on a sentence, a route, and a message have been chosen, there is no turning back, no halting to seek for a different word, for there is only the one right word, and the very hunt betrays the speaker as a foreigner to this tongue. To speak English is to carve figures, mighty yet hugely detailed from solid rock. To speak French is to compose poetic symphonies of cascading sounds. To speak either is to live in a mansion. To speak both is to know that language is only a game. The bilingual are philanderers. Having taken two lovers, they are always inevitably cheating. Um... I really enjoyed that as someone who is a lover of words and languages, although I don't speak more than one fluently. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a dilettante, I speak. Un petit peu français. Uh, un poco espanol. Ein bisschen deutsch. And... Hmm, I would say, sedikit bahasa Indonesia. <laughs> Steady get past Indonesia. Um, yeah, but I mean, you know, you pick up, especially when you're English um, and, and you travel, you do pick up little words um, as you go. But languages have always been really fascinating to me. And I just love her description there. It really, uh, I really took to it. But there's a lot of times in the book where uh, she examines uh, language and um, translating, translating between worlds, worlds that are being lived simultaneously together 
and yet are just vastly different. So, uh, yeah, it, it was a really, it's, it's a really interesting read that way. There's, um, some, there, there's also some examination of prejudice and bias. That's another theme in the book, uh, whether that is, uh, towards Jews or homosexuals. Um, and there are questions posed and, uh, yeah, that are, she poses in a very, uh, interesting way, I think. So uh, there was this part here, sorry, I'm probably, I'm just like guzzling, I'm just seeing, <laughs> seem to be very thirsty today. Um, Yet I still ponder the deportees of Drancy. What do we owe the unjustly dead? We who shared neither their faith nor their fate. So she's talking about uh, 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 people who were sent to death camps. Can we offer an act of memory? Or are our tears hypocritical and our stories presumptuous? Do we honor their history with our Sophie's Choice and our Schindler's List or merely dramatize it for our own pleasure? Will our remembrance guard against repetition, or is it only self-congratulation? How can I be sure that what I would have been, how can I be so sure that, sorry, that I would have uh, been the woman with a child stowed in her attic and not the one who was counting her neighbor's silver? Where would you have been as people are herded into crowded vehicles that will take them there. Is that us shepherding a friend to the basement or peeping out from behind a blind or ticking a name from a list? On the bus, it is dark. You can see nothing out the window. Can't follow the road, but trust the driver knows the route, even if you fear your unknown destination. Around you are whispered conversation, a loud question quickly hushed, some silence, even the snore of a man who has managed to fall asleep. Um... Unfortunately, I mean, those questions are still just as relevant today with lots of things going on all around the world. And she brings up similar uh, questions throughout the book in reference to not just the Holocaust, but um, uh, modern day situations as well, um, which I thought were really well put. So it is a book that makes you think, uh, and it is an interesting book. It took me on an interesting journey. I have to say, it's not going to get a five from me for the simple reason that I don't really enjoy books that have uh, female main characters whose focus is to filter the lives of men. I find that frustrating personally uh, because I think women have their own lives of their own merit and um, I like I understand that that's essentially what the book is about really is about uh, these women and their relationships with the men in their lives and I'm not a big fan of those kinds of books um, so it's not going to get a five for me it's going to get a four um, but overall, it is a it is a really good read. I don't remember where I got this book. I don't remember why I got this book. I don't know how long I've had this book. I'm just really, um, no idea. But I am I am very glad that I got finally got around to reading it. And I'm just checking for the date. It was copyrighted in 2003. So. It is, it does go pretty far back in the back list. Anyway, so that was Madame Proust and the Kosher Kitchen. I didn't even get into talking about uh, her, the issues of, around traditions and food and diet and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, it's an interesting read. If that sounds good to you, the book is Madame Proust and the Kosher Kitchen by Kate Taylor. And I give it four cups of tea. Happy reading.